Welcome everyone to today's technical assistance online event for HRSA HABs EHE funded jurisdictions. EHE being the ending the HIV epidemic, a plan for America. Responding to clusters of new HIV infections is one of the initiatives that US HABs prioritized EHE jurisdictions have incorporated into your work plans. This event is an exploration of who do you call and what do you do once a cluster is identified? It incorporates voices of people from the field who have responded to clusters uh, and uses an example of an outbreak in West Virginia. We're very pleased to partner with experts in, the, in, the, in this field to offer you the perspectives of people who've done the work with jurisdictions to plan, prepare, and respond to HIV clusters in their communities. Could I have the next slide, please? This uh, uh, project and this event are supported, as I said, by HRSA HAB, and the contents and viewpoints are not necessarily those, uh, the official views of HRSA uh, or the US government. This is our disclaimer slide. Next slide, please. Thank you. So who, who we are refers to the technical assistance provider. Our job is to strengthen and support the implementation of jurisdictions ending the epidemic work plans to contribute to the achievement of a reduction in new reported HIV cases by 75% by 2025. We've developed a national strategy designed to do just that, and we understand that the 75% reduction is an ambitious goal, and we know that our response needs to be equally ambitious. Next slide, please. And in order to, uh, to uh, accommodate the national reach of the TAP-IN mandate, we've assembled partners who, and faculty who together bring expertise on a broad range of interventions and topics. And this array of geographic and subject matter expertise allows TAP in the flexibility to call on needed experts in the development of TA plans and the delivery of focused technical, uh, technical support. And we'll give some examples today in our presentation of TA projects related to uh, cluster, responding to clusters. So as you can see on this slide, uh, the array of experts that we have assembled is, is very broad. Um, many of you indicated you were interested in expanding the network of service providers uh, that, are, uh, that you can call upon uh, in your EHE work plan. And um, one of our partners in particular who's presenting here today is the National Association of Community Health Centers. And can provide TA uh, on just that topic. Um, also, our review of your work plans shows that 13 jurisdictions specifically indicated that they wanted to partner with an FQHC. So it's, it's um, timely that uh, we're including NAC in our presentation today. Um, pardon me. The, you can also see that uh, our presentation and our, or our presenters today and our partners include the Mid-Atlantic AETC and a few other partners that are directly affiliated with AETCs in their regions. And that matches with our mandate to uh, optimize the use of all resources that are available to you jurisdictions in responding uh, to the HIV epidemic. Could I have the next slide, please? So our approach is regional, and you can see from this map that we've divided the nation into three regions. The New York City office of our organization uh, is um, uh, the headquarters for the whole project and for the Northeast and Midwest Central region, which is that darker blue or color. The Atlanta office that we maintain uh, in Georgia is the head office for the Southern region and the Los Angeles office that we have out in California is the headquarters for the Western region. Could I have the next slide, please? 
you can get to us pretty easily to request uh, a TA for your jurisdiction by going to tap in at caiglobal.org and letting us know what it is that you need in terms of TA. You can also make a request directly through your project officer. And in some cases, uh, we've had requests that have come through our partners as well. So let's move on to the presentation itself and I'll be back uh, toward the end to give you a few more examples of um, the way that uh, we can provide TA to you as the EHE jurisdictions. I'm gonna hand this over now to our MC for today's event, Dr. <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> pardon me, Dr. Linda Frank. Linda? Good afternoon, good morning uh, to all of you. Thank you for being here and welcome. And I wanna first off, thank you for all the work that you're currently and have been doing in the HIV epidemic. I'm pleased to be part of TAP In um, and um, be part of Ending the Epidemic uh, Initiative, which has been my life work since 1988. So today we're gonna be talking about responding to an HIV cluster or outbreak and who do you call, what do you do? Next slide, please. Next slide, please. The session goals for today. Um, first of all, we're gonna talk about uh, what is outbreak response? How, what is the difference between an outbreak and a cluster? Good question. Um, engagement of uh, community partners in jurisdictions. Approaches to coordination. Um, what's the role of federal, state, and local agencies in response? Next slide. And at the end of this session, um, you'll be able to um, also learn about um, what are the clinical care and linkage to services for testing, for treatment, for PrEP, and for behavioral health intervention, which is often needed, um, as well as, su as support services um, for uh, folks uh, that may be impacted by an outbreak or a cluster. One of the things that we did in, in putting this together, um, next slide, please, is we wanted to hear from people who were on the ground during um, the outbreak in West Virginia. And that's what we've done here today. Um, and we're pleased to um, bring those persons to you um, to talk directly to you about what it was like. So the speakers, um, along with uh, Will, who you just heard from, we're gonna be hearing from Heather Hawk, who's the Deputy Associate Administrator for uh, HAB at HRSA, Russell Brown from um, NAC, uh, Edwin Corbin uh, Gutera from NASDAD, Jennifer Flanagan from NASDAD. Next slide, please. We'll be hearing from Carolyn Kin. Uh, Jeanette, uh, unfortunately, is not able to be with us today. Next slide, please. And then we have pre recorded interviews from Michael Kilkenny, who is the physician director from the Cabo Huntington County Health Department. Carol, uh, Carol Willenberg, um, Dr. Willenberg is the Associate Professor and Chief of Infectious Diseases at Marshall University. Amy Atkins, who's the Director of Epidemiology and Prevention Services at the West Virginia Department of Health and Human Services. And Andrea Rogers, who's Director of the WVU Positive Health Clinic Laboratory Director and at the West Virginia Bureau of Public Health Rapid Testing Program. Next slide, please. We're gonna go into a poll now uh, because we want your participation. Um, so you'll see that the poll is um, on your screen. So we ask you to please respond uh, to the first question. Um, I think that substance use is a major problem in my jurisdiction. Could people please respond to that um, through the polling tab at the bottom of your screen? 100% agree with this. Next question. Whoops, oh, 20% strongly agree, 80% agree. All right, second question. I anticipate that our jurisdiction would be prepared to respond to an HIV outbreak or cluster. Can you answer that question? Oh, we're seeing that 
most people are neutral on this. Some people agree, a few people strongly agree, some people disagree. Question number three, I have information and knowledge of my state's outbreak response plan. Hmm, this is a bit all over the map. Most people are in agree or neutral on this one. Um, only 10% strongly agree that they are, they know, have knowledge of their state's outbreak plan. And question number four, I think that improvements could be made in coordination between state, local, and federal resources for HIV and substance use. 61% of all of you agree with that, um, and 30% agree. And I know who to call to get information about what to do in response to a cluster or an outbreak. Hmm. Again, this one varies. Um, with only 37% saying they agree, 25% saying being neutral, and only 21% strongly agreeing that they know what to do. Um, okay. All right, thank you everybody. So I'm gonna share these results so everybody can see them. And could I have the next slide, please? I'm pleased uh, to have the opportunity to introduce Heather Hawk, who is the Deputy Associate Administrator um, for the HIV AIDS Bureau at HRSA. Next slide, please. I'd like to turn this over to Heather Hawk. Great. Thank you, Dr. Frank. And uh, I'd like to add my welcome and our thanks uh, to all of you who are attending this uh, webinar today. Um, we at HRSA are very enthusiastic about today's technical assistance event that uh, CIA or have funded e Ending the HIV Epidemic Initiative uh, technical assistance provider is hosting to support you all as you implement strategies to respond to new clusters of HIV infections. And I think the results of the poll that you've all just completed uh, does demonstrate how useful I think this, uh, this uh, webinar today is going to be for everybody. So for today's webinar, the CIA Technical Assistance Provider Innovation Network, or what we call TAP-IN, includes presenters from several organizations to illustrate the depth and the breadth of the technical assistance that is available to help you all ensure effective mobilization of resources in a cluster response. Such mobilization includes communication, coordination, and collaboration among the jurisdiction, we as federal partners, your community, and service providers. But before I turn it over to the speakers, I just wanna say a couple of words about cluster response. Next slide, please. As you all know, um, you certainly all know, uh, that the Ending the HIV Epidemic, A Plan for America, set a very ambitious goal to reduce new infections to 3,000 by 2030, and obviously resources through both our resources at HRSA as well as CDC resources have been made available to jurisdictions to help you achieve those goals. Our HRSA have funded jurisdictions are addressing both pillar two, which is uh, the treat pillar, as you can see on the slide, um, and pillar four, as you can see on the slide, and the topic of today's webinar, to respond to new clusters of HIV infections. And to respond to new cl clusters of HIV infections, we know that we now have the technology and now the resources to implement strategies to improve our cluster response everywhere from detection all the way through investment investigation to intervention and ultimately getting people into HIV care and treatment and retained in HIV care and treatment. Next slide. In order to do that, we know that we have to have a robust, robust public health response to clusters. That will allow us to reduce new infections by ensuring that people who are identified as part of this response are linked to HIV treatment and achieve viral suppression or are prescribed biomedical interventions for HIV prevention. We know that we're also well positioned at this unique time where we have the knowledge, the technology, and now the resources through the EAG initiative for jurisdictions to be able to implement strategies to improve cluster response. Um, we really need to look at uh, strengthening the systems that jurisdictions have in place to investigate and intervene 
by ensuring collaboration among internal and external partners. And one of the things that you're going to hear from our presenters today is how technical assistance can support and amplify the impact of effective planning and coordination, most importantly, for a cluster response at the state and local level. Next slide. I think it's also important to discuss um, uh, how a federal agency, how from a federal agency perspective, um, we can talk about how we can work with you and other agencies such as CDC and SAMHSA to support you in your cluster response. So our presenters from the Mid-Atlantic AETC are going to talk about a real world example to illustrate the importance of ensuring resources are effectively reaching the people who are most in need. Linkage to medical care and social supports, and that's a critically important we found in all sorts of uh, outbreak responses. And benefits, obviously, is an acute need of people identified in clusters. The Atlantic AETC's example will help jurisdictions identify potential gaps in your capacity to respond to a cluster and illustrate the technical assistance that is available to help develop a core group of essential community providers who are ready to engage with people uh, identified as part of your cluster. Another of today's presenters is from the National Association of Community Health Centers, who will discuss how technical assistance can strengthen existing or establish new partnerships with organizations that have authentic and trusted relationships with the communities we need to reach. And again, as we found in both Austin, Indiana and in uh, West Virginia, that trusted relationship is really critical to the success of responding to a cluster. And uh, last but not least, we will also hear from NASDAD, uh, which is the HAB-funded uh, EHE systems coordination provider that, uh, that has developed technical assistance tools to guide engagement with communities to come to a mutual understanding of the role of cluster response in preventing HIV and linking people to the resources that they need. Lastly, we wanna point out the fact that uh, data sharing agreements are critical tools. Next slide, please are critical tools to assure rapid response and technical assistance is available from both the tap in and the skip to ensure that jurisdictions can use data to improve their capacity to respond. And again, I can't underscore emphasize uh, more how much uh, data sharing is of such critical importance, importance in outbreak responses uh, because of the need to really make sure that you have a seamless system to address the needs of people uh, identified during the cluster response. Next slide. So by the end of today's event, you should all have a better understanding of how CIA's technical assistance provider innovation, or again, tap in, uh, with its wide array of technical experts, along with our strategic partner, NASDAQ, as the skip, can help jurisdictions develop the teamwork needed to bridge uh, often what are silos um, in jurisdictions and build the capacity to collaborate before, during, and after the crisis of an HIV cluster. And I really encourage you all to utilize these technical assistance resources for your EHE efforts. Now, before I turn it over to our presenters, I'm also going to want to be sure that you all are aware of what we and our federal role as a federal agency um, do in assisting you with a cluster response. Next slide. So when you all identify um, the, a potential uh, HIV cluster, we work with you, HRSA, works with you and other federal agencies to help identify and ensure that the full system of federal resources are available to respond to a cluster. And we do that through something called asset mapping. And asset mapping is really the process of identifying resources either established or potential and developing an inventory of who and what are available and where those are located. Through this process, we can identify gaps and uh, new and different partners can also be identified. And we look across the board as federal agencies at where is there access to testing, where does there need to be capacity for testing, where is there access to HIV care and treatment, and where does capacity need to be developed. Similarly, with other types of care, behavioral health, STI treatment, hepatitis treatment, we need to look at where those resources are located and where we might need to develop them. Thing with medical case management, transportation, food, and housing. And those are really the ones that we found in other uh, cluster responses are the critical ones that we need to understand uh, where those resources uh, exist and how we need to, if they don't exist in certain areas, how we need to work across our federal agencies and work with you in the, in the jurisdictions to ensure that we're developing the capacity 
and the access points for those types of services to respond to a cluster. So through this asset mapping process um, that we've done with a number of jurisdictions who have had uh, cluster outbreaks uh, over the past few years, we have really been able to assist jurisdictions with finding behavioral health access points. We've also, um, and you'll hear probably this talked about today, we found um, training uh, capacity to add additional service providers um, who are able to address HIV and hepatitis care and treatment uh, for, for people um, in the jurisdictions. And we've also, through this asset mapping process, been able to figure out where there are potential partnerships and establish those partnerships with new organizations to ensure that there are, uh, they're able to deliver the support services that are so critical um, to people uh, living with HIV. Um, or people who are at risk of HIV through this cluster response process. Next slide. So this is a very busy slide that we show. And any of you who attended our National Ryan White Conference um, in August of last year um, and attended our institute on HIV cluster outbreak and response um, should recognize this very busy slide. Um, it's a one we developed in partnership with our CDC cluster response colleagues who are led uh, by Alexa Oster. And we really use it to describe what we mean by collaboration and by bringing our federal assets in partnership with you all um, to assist you in a cluster response. And as you can see from all of the various lines and uh, dotted lines and straight lines, if you just click it a couple times, it'll actually, the full animation, keep going. Keep, keep going. I think that might be it. Yep, that's it. Um, so you can see uh, how we sort of visualize um, how all of their relationships um, work together. And you can see that it really does take a village to respond to a cluster, which is again why proactive planning, implementation drills, and then once you know, hopefully, uh, it, it hopefully you won't get there, but if you do get there in terms of a HIV cluster, this coordination, communication, and collaboration is so critical um, to ensuring that, uh, that, that we have a robust public health response to an HIV cluster. Um, uh, so with that, I am going to uh, turn it over uh, to Dr. Linda Frank, again, from the Mid-Atlantic 8 DC, one of our critical partners in this work. Um, I apologize, I do have to hop off a little bit before two o'clock um, for, for another meeting. Um, however, if there are any questions for HRSA's HIV AIDS Bureau or federal agencies um, that we are, I'm not able to respond to before I hop off, um, I uh, I have been assured that um, that our uh, our um, our technical assistant, our tap in uh, partners, as well as our AETC partners, will make sure that those questions get back to us, and we will respond accordingly. So, thank you all again very much for participating today. And uh, Dr. Frank, I will hand it back over to you. Thank you so much, and thank you for uh, being here today, um, and all the work that you do on behalf of persons with HIV. Um, we so appreciate it. Um, okay, let's let's move on. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So, what happened? What happened in West Virginia? Um, this is a site that people can go to to look at um, the ongoing tracking of, of the cluster that occurred in uh, West Virginia, uh, which started with about twenty eight. Um, cases and uh, that increased to 113 in Cabell County, West Virginia, which is what you see here in red. Now, keep in mind that West Virginia is sort of the heartland of Appalachia. Um, and so there are a lot of issues um, going on in West Virginia, uh, social determinants of health um, that perhaps contributed to what we have seen um, in West Virginia with this with this cluster, um, because what we know about uh, some the some of the this initial group is th that got infected. Uh, they were unstably housed. Um, so you can go to this website and and get an update. Next slide, please. So there's this issue about what's a cluster, what's an outbreak. And this is the current CDC definition for cluster. It refers to an aggregation of cases grouped in place and time that are suspected to be greater than the number expected, even though the expected number may not be known. There's too many ex expected in that, in that sentence. Um, 
but that's how it's written. Outbreak carries the same definition of epidemic, but is often used for more limited geographic area. Um, and the determination of the difference is related to a range of factors, including those outlined in the CDC's cluster detection and response guidance. For example, for example, smaller clusters may be more likely related to sexual transmission with larger clusters linked to injection drug use. So this would be an, an issue that um, TA could be provided um, by TAP-IN. Um, and one of the important things about um, outbreaks is it's important to have good data so that you can maybe predict where there might be um, a cluster or an outbreak. This is, this is the, what we're talking about now in terms of um, public health. This is a public health issue. Um, and so these are, the data is very important to get our hands on to figure out where resources need to go. Can I have the next slide, please? So what factors may contribute? One of the things we know about rural areas and for areas all over the country, is we have this interstate highway system um, that may be involved in trafficking drugs, sex work, um, other things, uh, trafficking in general. Um, uh, so along the interstate highways, you know, if you go down I-95, the Eastern Corridor, you go across Interstate 80 in Pennsylvania and down 79, um, you know, that's how the drugs move around. So that may be a, a factor, but, um, but there's many others that you're gonna hear about today. Next slide, please. So was there a warning? Well, sure. The Indiana outbreak um, that everybody has heard about, um, after that happened in um, Indiana, um, the CDC put out this map. Um, and it showed where they predicted, they used the data. Um, and that's is what, this is what we talk about in terms of precision public health, is using the data to drive what we do, drive prevention, um, drive where to put resources. Um, and it showed, this map shows where outbreaks may occur. And West Virginia was certainly there in pink, the issue see, Southern Ohio, um, Kentucky, Tennessee, all the places that are in pink. And I'm, I'm sure you've seen this before. Um, a lot of these areas receive ending the epidemic funding. Um, some of them do not. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Now, the Mid-Atlantic AETC was involved um, in this outbreak and we developed this, what we call a critical incident model that I developed um, and it outlines for you, and I don't need to go through it bit by bit, but all the people and all the entities that need to be involved in responding to an outbreak. Something that Heather just mentioned, that HRSA helps to bring collaborations between all these entities, federal partners, state partners, academic partners, hospital partners, community health center partners, other local partners, the courts, law enforcement, um, and in the middle, all of the kinds of things that, that you all know, that people who are at risk for HIV um, or have HIV need, the kinds of services that they need. In this case, um, you know, with the outbreak, uh, it occurred amongst um, injection drug users, the transmission. And so we got to link people, not just to substance use treatment, but we got to link them to HIV treatment if they're not HIV positive, um, you know, we got to link them to PrEP or, or their partners, linking their partners to getting, to getting on PrEP um, and linking them to uh, support services. Um, and in this case, in West Virginia, housing services and all kinds of wraparound services that you're going to be hearing about shortly. Next slide, please. So this shows the capacity building model um, for a cluster and outbreak um, that I developed. And it's more than simply knowing what to do. It's more than simply knowing about PrEP. It's more than simply knowing how to do HIV testing. It's how to get it done and 
who can help to get it done. So it involves not just training, but planning, surveillance, looking at existing policies, identifying knowledge and skill gaps. It relates to workforce organization. How do you mobilize the community? How do you mobilize agencies? How do you figure out what the state re outbreak response plan, plan is? Um, and what do federal partners do? And you're gonna be hearing about that momentarily. So the drivers for this are local needs and what are the risk populations, the gaps? What are the state policies and what are the federal policies? Those have to be known or determined really. And so what are the output, outputs that you want? You want enhanced outreach, practice change, policy change, building new partnerships, improved communication, linkage to prevention, linkage to treatment and community engagement. And the community engagement is so, so important in this. And you're gonna hear people from who were on the ground talk about this so well. Next slide, please. So what happened at the onset of this cluster or in the outbreak? So what are, what are some considerations? The primary goal really is to mitigate the cluster or the outbreak. You've got to engage all these people listed here, CDC, state health departments, HRSA, Ryan White, training resources. Next slide. Who are priority partners? health departments, HIV providers, community health centers, substance use treatment programs, behavioral health, social service organizations. And you gotta keep it going with communications, calls, meetings, emails, et cetera. And that was what the schematic talked about um, that I presented a few moments ago. Next slide, please. This was the initial um, notice in West Virginia of the outbreak. Um, that came from um, West Virginia Department of Health and Human Resources, uh, the Bureau of Public Health. Um, so this is what came out. So what I wanna do now is I want you to hear from Dr. Michael Kilkenny, who is the physician director from the Cabo Huntington Health Department. And he's gonna talk about this. Early in the outbreak, uh, when we were first alerted to its presence, uh, because we had, uh, because we operated a harm reduction program in Cabell County, we were able to uh, notify the clients of the harm reduction program of the increase uh, in HIV amongst them. And they were already aware of that and concerned about it. Uh, so, when as soon as we were able to expand our testing capacity, uh, we got a really robust response from our clients to get tested, and uh, and it really uh, expanded rapidly as far as our um, as far as our testing capacity and the acceptance of that testing uh, because of our existing um, relationship with the population that we were uh, targeting. Second thing that we did that was really important to our response uh, in terms of an early response was we organized our health department to operate in uh, the National Incident Management System. That is, we, uh, we had an emergency situation, so we acted like it was an emergency and we organized our response in emergency structure. Uh, it took us a little while to incorporate a multi-jurisdictional unified command structure with the West Virginia Bureau for Public Health and the CDC, but we accomplished that and the, the command structure, the communication that we were able to develop early on was one of the keys to um, a successful response to the outbreak. One of the issues that we really would have liked to know um, before the outbreak is we would have really liked to have known the surveillance data regarding HIV. In West Virginia in 2018, 
And from uh, essentially the 1980s, uh, HIV data was held very securely. Uh, we were a low incidence state and therefore most of the counties were dealing with small numbers and protecting the confidentiality of those people was important because it was still a stigmatized disease uh, even to um, 2018. So um, we would have liked to have had that surveillance data. We would have liked to have known earlier that we had HIV increasing. Uh, we learned it in 2018 because the infectious disease specialists were telling us that they were seeing it and our clients were telling us they were seeing it, but we had no official surveillance notification during 2018 that anything was happening. Uh, as it turns out, when we were notified in January of 2019, this outbreak had already uh, been established to have started probably in January of 2018. So we got a one year um, delay in response to an outbreak uh, because we did not have access to the surveillance data. During the response, the surveillance system was uh, re-engineered for the state of West Virginia. And I can say that today, a county will get much um, more real-time uh, information regarding any changes in their HIV status in their county. So that's a remarkable improvement. Uh, the Ryan White program was used to serving maybe uh, five to eight new uh, clients in a year's time and all of a sudden we had 80 in a year's time so that 10 times uh, response uh, overwhelmed the Ryan White's uh, program's capacity we were able to establish uh, contact and get tremendous support from HRSA Early in the outbreak, uh, when we Hi there. I think we had a little problem here, uh, but we're going to move on. Um, you're going to hear from uh, Dr. Kilkenny Moore in a little bit, but I want to introduce Dr. Kara Willenberg, who's the Associate Professor and Chief of Infectious Diseases at the School of Medicine at Marshall University. She was very involved in helping to provide services, HIV services, um, for those people who were identified. So let's hear from Dr. Willenberg. The outbreak started in 2018, looking back, but we were not aware of it uh, ongoing until 2019. And it was a cold winter day in 2019 when I got a call from the health department that they had six new positive cases of HIV. And I have done um, STI clinic at the health department since I came to West Virginia in 2013. And so it's not uncommon for me to get a call if there's a new diagnosis of HIV through the health department. The number being six out of a large testing event was very unusual. And it hit like a ton of bricks that we had a much bigger problem than we were aware of. And so my role, you know, was to start uh, coordinating and communicating with the health department and identifying other community partners so that we could get people into care and link to care as quickly as possible. The population that this affected is our, um, HR, is our IV drug user population. And it is primarily uh, centered around a homeless community. So one of the really good points to all of this for us is that we already had harm reduction up and running. And that was located at the health department, which is pretty centrally located for our homeless population. Um, in addition, I already had a working relationship with the health department. And our community works really well historically 
um, with groups within the community. So our health department already worked with our homeless coalition. They have have frequent communication with um, police, fire, and EMS. And so they had ongoing partnerships working on our IV drug abuse problem in our community for quite some time. So that all helped in our response. My initial response was to determine how to link people to care who may not have a means of communication or a means of transportation. And so we started that with, with a simple process that once people became positive, were tested positive through the health department was our primary start because that was where most of our testing was going on. Um, that we would, we gave them a standing appointment for our clinic. And so the standing appointment date and time was for the very next day um, at a set time. And it was every day, Monday through Friday. And if it happened on a weekend or a Friday, then it would be for the next business day. In addition, if it was, you know, at a later time in the day, we had a very open door policy for the health department to call and get someone in right away. Um, in addition, I started seeing HIV patients soon afterwards at the health department. And so that's a afternoon a week walk up clinic basis. And so if people were more comfortable being seen there than um, having an appointment at our clinic, um, that was an option as well. Having people get a scheduled appointment the next day was very important because the diagnosis was still new. They were likely to come to visits, um, at least that first visit, and then we could start the conversation about HIV. Our health department nurses are very well-versed, and certainly they became well-versed in um, counseling about HIV and their diagnosis. And you know, talking to them about how to get into care and how important it was to get into care. We also, having that appointment also allowed us to make a list essentially of everyone in the outbreak in our area. The outbreak started Okay. We're going to be hearing more from Dr. Wellenberg again, um, but we now want to move on to hear about what the state health department did in West Virginia. Next slide, please. Uh, this was a second um, official notification sent out by the West Virginia Department of Health and Human Services. Um, this is dated October of 2019. Um, next slide, please. We're gonna now be hearing from Amy Atkins, who's the Director, Office of Epidemiology and Prevention Services at the West Virginia Department of Health and Human Resources. I'm happy to be here to share West Virginia's story of a response to an increase in HIV cases identified in Cabell County, West Virginia. West Virginia has historically been a low incidence state for HIV with an annual average of 78 newly diagnosed cases of HIV reported between 2014 and 2017. However, West Virginia remains vulnerable to rapid transmission and outbreaks of hepatitis C and HIV among persons who inject drugs as a result of the state's ongoing substance use epidemic. During this same time frame of 2014 to 2017, we saw an annual average of 12 cases of newly diagnosed HIV among individuals reporting injection drug use as a risk factor. Beginning in 2017, West Virginia has seen increases in HIV among persons who inject drugs in Southern West Virginia, Ohio County, and most recently beginning in 2018 in Cabell County. The shift in epidemiology and HIV cases in Cabell County to include persons who inject drugs was most notably seen in the fourth quarter of 2018. And at that time, a comprehensive and collaborative investigation was initiated by the West Virginia Bureau for Public Health, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Cabell County Health Department. Our initial response included joint meetings and a remote technical assistance from the CDC beginning in January with the Cabell Huntington Health Department and the Centers for Disease Control evaluating the scope of the outbreak and developing an understanding of the state and local capacity to respond to the outbreak and identifying targeted needs so that we could mount an effective response. 
This resulted in a state request to the CDC for direct assistance in the formation of a unified command structure that involved agency representatives from the CDC, the State Health Department, and the Cabell Huntington Health Department. In January of 2019, the state notified Cabell Huntington Health Department and the CDC of this increase in HIV cases associated with injection drug use. The CDC provided remote technical assistance through the months of January and February, and in March of 2019, the CDC conducted a three-day site visit to assess operational needs, and a request for direct assistance was submitted by the State Health Department. The state request included um, request for state program technical assistance support that would um, help us build enhanced surveillance practices. And it also included a local request for assistance for disease investigation personnel that could provide surge capacity staffing to the Cabell Huntington Health Department and surrounding areas. It also included a targeted epi aid request that was intended to build a social network strategy designed to support early diagnosis of HIV, expansion of PrEP in Cabell County to support prevention, and outreach to sex workers in Cabell County. Additionally, local partners and the state were able to access technical assistance from HRSA that aligned local resources with targeted response objectives and the state also was able to apply for and receive supplemental funding through HRSA to build and expand capacity to support linkage to care and disease investigation personnel. One of the most important success factors of the response was the collaboration between all levels of government and among our federal, state, and local partners. We use the incident command structure to define roles and responsibilities and establish domains that aligned with the four pillars outlined in the federal ending the HIV epidemic initiative, which include diagnose all people with HIV as early as possible after infection, treat the infection rapidly and effectively to achieve sustained viral suppression, prevent new HIV transmissions by using proven interventions such as PrEP and syringe services programs, and respond quickly to potential outbreaks. The CDC provided on-site technical personnel to advise and help build stronger, more responsive surveillance processes, and also to help us adjust our workflows to increase the timeframe between diagnosis and linkage to care. Our Mid-Atlantic AIDS Education and Training Center provided just-in-time training to providers and stakeholders, and our WVU Rapid Testing Program provided training to support the use of modern rapid testing protocols. The outbreak in Cabell County raised the importance of ensuring communities have access to more timely data regarding HIV transmission. Response to these outbreaks is local and communities need access to information and to appropriate and timely action. Our West Virginia Department of Health and Human Resources website was revised to include HIV data that is published weekly and with support from our federal partners, we enhanced our HIV surveillance practices, and as a result, we're able to identify an increase in Kanawha County much earlier. The response in Kanawha was able to be informed by our experience in Cabell in terms of quickly establishing a robust and intensive linkage to care program for newly diagnosed individuals that meet people where they are, build trusting and supportive relationships, and provide what they need to seek care and support. We still have a lot of work to do to adapt these processes to more rural communities, but we have advanced many facets of HIV programming as a result of this collaborative work. I'm happy to be here to share. It was great to hear um, Amy talk about um, the response. And now we're going to hear from Andrea Rogers. Um, as you know, in a cluster or an outbreak, ramping up HIV testing is critical because those people who test positive, we got to get them linked to care and on ART um, and other kinds of services that they need. Um, but also those people who test ne negative, we got to get them access to PrEP and ongoing primary care. So Andrea is going to talk um, about um, what was done in terms of ramping up testing in the West Virginia cluster. And she is the director of the West Virginia Positive Health Clinic Laboratory Director. 
and she also works for the West Virginia Bureau of Public Health in their rapid testing program. The rapid testing program that I oversee as laboratory director is uh, a statewide testing program where I oversee the disease intervention specialists who are the folks that normally are the people that are the first line to go out and let people know that they have been exposed to um, an infectious disease. So a disease intervention specialist will go out and tell someone you have been exposed to someone with syphilis or HIV. And at that point, I train them to offer point of care rapid HIV testing. And so um, with this program, we're able to quickly identify people um, who are contacts and partners of newly identified HIV infected uh, persons. So in February of 2019, we set up a, uh, the Cabell Huntington Health Department has a harm reduction program, a very successful harm reduction program. And we went in and offered uh, $10 incentives to folks who inject drugs to get tested for HIV so that we could help identify if there was uh, an increased number of cases. And on that day in February, we identified seven um, new HIV cases um, among less than 200 people that we tested. So we knew that there was a real crisis. Um, at that point, we kind of all got together at the health department and made a plan for what to do next because we knew that there was definitely a cluster, potentially um, something bigger um, going on that we needed to um, move quickly. So with Dr. Kilkenny and the nursing staff at the health department, we sat down and mapped out a plan for the health department nurses to quickly change their algorithm to do a rapid, rapid uh, testing algorithm. It's not a diagnostic definition, but what it does is it satisfies the surveillance definition for evidence of active HIV infection and it allows a person to in one setting within less than a half an hour to learn that they are they there's high likelihood they have HIV infection and to link them to care. The rapid test. So the next thing we want to talk about is federal response. And what was it like working with CDC in a cluster and outbreak? So let's hear again um, from Dr. Kilkenny. I know that local health departments that don't work with CDC very often uh, might find their ways uh, to be a uh, very rigid, very um, uh, difficult to adapt to, but uh, we had worked with CDC in, um, in evaluating uh, what was an incident in 2016 where we had a large overdose event uh, when carfentanil was introduced to our community and it made national news. We investigated that out, that outbreak of overdose as a disease outbreak, and we had um, CDC uh, folks embedded in the state health department that worked with us to investigate that. So we were a little bit familiar with CDC's uh, use of terminology, CDC's structure. Uh, they are. Um, uh, some would say very rigid. I would say that uh, they're very precise uh, in working with them in response to this uh, HIV outbreak. Uh, we had a lot of CDC contact. CDC had people on the ground in our community for months, including an outbreak director and I spent hours and hours um, 
talking uh, regarding official actions and uh, and getting to know CDC and how CDC operates. Um, and so it was pretty easy for us to adapt to what I consider to be a higher level of excellence than what we're used to. Uh, since we uh, strive for a higher level of excellence, I uh, tried to adapt everything that I could learn from CDC's uh, structure. And because the lead from CDC was also a fantastic communicator, uh, we were able to really work tremendously well with CDC. CDC was, uh, you know, really looked up to in our community as far as their expertise, but their ability to um, communicate with the community as they were teaching um, how to do rapid testing for HIV, or what's the importance of doing HIV testing in emergency departments. Uh, when I would go to the hospital to meet with their administration and their emergency department administration, along with a CDC liaison, um, we got tremendous response. They have a lot of information uh, that we don't know they have. Uh, we, we, it's easy for us to sit down here and say, well, we know our community better than CDC does. Uh, they understood that we knew context uh, better than they did. And they always asked us for the context. We always merged content and context in all of our operations with CDC. And because we had a command structure where we knew what their role was and we did not go into their lane, they knew what our role was. They did not cross into our lane. We really then uh, were able to respect each other's professional work and, um, and emulate the best parts of that. Uh, given then that that structure had at its true pinnacle, the state health department, the state health department being the end responsible agent for an outbreak like this. Um, we were able to really draft uh, communication protocols, uh, so that we spoke to each other in standard language that we all understood. We were able to um, uh, stay in our lanes, so to speak, for the most part. That doesn't mean that we didn't step on each other's toes, uh, but when one of us stepped on the other's toes, we were able to respectfully voice that and correct it. Um, it was uh, very, very uh, gratifying to work with CDC, uh, to learn from them, to see what their true capacity is. And it only um, made them stronger in my eyes. Uh, we always try to um, emulate their uh, procedures. And we uh, know that we're doing a higher level of public health. Our public health is, uh, is more strongly supported by a science basis than it was previously. And that's because we worked with CDC uh, and worked with them so closely. I know that. The next thing we're gonna talk about is collaborations and linkages for patients, because we know that's so important. Let's hear again for doc, from Dr. Wellenberg. We worked closely with the CDC and with our local pharmacy was, our Marshall Pharmacy was another partner of ours and our Homeless Coalition, as well as Ryan White Part B. We did lots of things quickly, but over time. So the first thing we did was we increased um, prep training throughout our community. 
this was um, through an initial effort of the CDC. We had tried this a few years prior and we had poor uptake, but with our outbreak, providers really wanted to be helpful. And so prescribing PrEP is a way that anyone can be helpful. And so um, we started a PrEP training initiative that involved um, not just primary care, but also OB to our high-risk mothers, as well as um, pediatrics for our adolescents. Uh, we also worked with our ERs to establish testing within the ER. We recognize that a lot of our patients had crossed through the ER maybe multiple times before their diagnosis was made. And one of the key elements to getting uptake of testing uh, in the ER was to take the responsibility of reporting if that patient left AMA or, you know, did not have a phone to be called back once their test resulted. And as well as, you know, they also need a follow-up visit. So we established standing follow-up visits through the ER for positives. And then we help them, uh, we assume some of the responsibility. And by we, I mean um, our clinic and the DIS worker at the health department who the DIS workers were also very instrumental in, in making all this function. So someone who met a small number of requirements um, identified to be at high risk um, in the emergency department would be offered a test. Then if that test was positive, then they would be offered a standing appointment in ID clinic for the next business day. Um, in addition, I would be messaged. And then if they, that person were to have left before they were notified of their appointment, then I was able to communicate with our DIS worker who would then find our patient. Um, the system also allowed for us to put them on our roster of members of our outbreaks, so to speak, so that when they do pass through harm reduction at the health department, then we would be able to intervene and speak to them. Part B was this very instrumental. Um, our Part B worker, Melanie, started being at the health department so that she could counsel people on entering into care. Um, she also developed a whole new skill set regarding um, social services, which she was great at already, but having people establish with Medicaid and obtain an ID all became very important. So um, she was at the health department on certain days. And then we, um, Part B was also able to hire another person who her sole job is to be at the health department and work as a linkage to care specialist. So those have been very essential. We worked with our Part C counterpart for transportation for our folks to medical appointments, and that was through a medical Uber service. Um, we collaborate with our homeless coalition in town very closely um, because they help to house our uh, people living with HIV, among other homeless people in our community. And they have a very open relationship with our homeless community. They offer food, they are a, a day drop in location for our um, members of our community. And so they are often our first door in establishing linkage to care and already have those relationships with people. We started a monthly meeting. Um, it was actually every two weeks initially where we met and discussed our clients and um, who needed what and who needed help being linked to care so that they could be identified at the health department. We also worked with our Marshall Pharmacy, as we had said before. This was a very unique and great opportunity for us. They deliver our HIV um, antiretrovirals to the health department. The health department keeps these medications and distributes them either on a weekly basis or a daily basis um, to members of our homeless community so that their items aren't stolen or they don't lose them. And that way they wouldn't lose a whole month's worth of medications at a time. And also when they come in to get their meds, it's a you know a, a time to have a conversation and maybe a little pep talk and how are you feeling and are you doing okay? And do you need food today? And so that's one thing that we've done. Um, the other thing we've done is um, incentives. And I know that this can be controversial at times. So we started, giving food and we had a food pantry at our clinic that had started probably within the year before the outbreak. And we recognized that a lot of the people utilizing our food pantry were um, patients through our HIV clinic and our ID clinic in general. So 
we kept this food pantry going. The state recognized the good of this food pantry. And so they now fund our food pantry. So we give a bag of food every time someone comes for a visit. Um, we never say no to food. We used incentives initially, um, such as gift cards um, to uh, the local gas stations or the Kroger to um, help people, you know, come to their appointment. We've transitioned that, you know, a lot of our population is in and out of care. They um, have ongoing substance abuse problems. And so we had to transition the use of our incentives to more of a goal directed program and less of a, you know, initially it was please show up, we want you to show up, we want you in care. And then we recognized that they were really only showing up for the gift card and still not taking meds. And so we've had to try, we're now trialing a more of a goal directed uh, incentive plan, except for food. Food is never goal directed. Food is necessary for everyone. And, and we give that with no strings attached. Um, and so, but our other incentives that are more financial based, those we want you to meet certain goals now and, and we'll see if this works and if it doesn't, then we'll, you know, transition that again. I think that, you know, guidance and recommendations for how to deal with a potential outbreak in your community is, you know, the first thing is be flexible. Some things are going to work, some things are not going to work, and you're going to need to change how things function, you know, as time goes on. You know, some things work initially, like our incentives program, and then after a while, we all recognized that that was no longer doing what we needed it to do. And so we, we brainstormed and changed that. I think the other thing is, is, you know, if you don't already have community partnerships, look for those and form those. You know, we are lucky that we had harm reduction that was centrally located as a starting point for our population to, to meet up and to obtain care. Not all places have that. And so you're going to have to maybe be creative um, about where you're able to set up care and who you partner with. So our important partners have been our pharmacy, um, our health department, our homeless coalition, um, our certainly our part Ryan White services have been essential through all of this um, and can continue to be so. So I think, you know, be creative. There are lots of opportunities to work within your community and communities want to help in general. They want their community to be healthy and, and, you know, to do better and it's a good thing. And so, you know, utilize those opportunities. We worked. So next, um, thanks for staying with us. We're going to be talking about uh, opportunities for continued intervention to improve coordination and care. And Dr. Gilkenny has a few things to say about this as well. Yeah, so by the end of 2019, we had had a very remarkable reduction in new cases of HIV as a result of our intervention. Uh, even to the point where I think we had a month with no new cases and that was uh, really incredibly um, um, energizing to us that we'd been successful. Uh, we got a couple of scattered cases then uh, around the first of this year and then uh, COVID had a remarkable negative impact. Uh, what we learned in our response is that with this marginalized community of injection drug users and uh, the way medicine generally treats them, our strongest response is respect. Our strongest ally is that contact, that ability to meet face to face with people. Um, for our uh, program folks, to hug these people, to get close to them, to listen to what they're experiencing, uh, and then to help them uh, address their concerns rather than asking them to address our concerns. Um, that was one of the real keys to having impact and getting deeper into the social networks that where this disease is spreading, you have to have trust 
and um, you get trust by um, being trustworthy and being respectful. So when COVID took away our face-to-face, -face, limited the amount of time we could share in the same space, limited our ability to hear the stories, we began to lose that contact that we needed. And we began to see the full impact of the ongoing transmission for our uh, community while we had had um, somewhere in the neighborhood of 70 cases associated with that outbreak by the time we had brought it under control in October of 2019. We have another 35 cases that occurred after COVID restricted our response. And, uh, again, I said before, if you limit your response, you get a limited um, impact. So anything, whether it's policy, whether it's pandemic, um, that, that limits your ability to connect personally with folks who really, really uh, need that personal uh, connection. Uh, it has a, a terrible effect on your ability to control HIV. Uh, so we're looking forward to the end of the pandemic that uh, that bright lights on the horizon and we can see it. Uh, and when we do, we'll, we'll have a lot of ground to a retake in stopping the spread of HIV in our community and leading to that day when there is no more new HIV in our, uh, in our country. So important, respect and trust. Content and context, very important in responding to an, to an outbreak or cluster. Now we're going to move on um, to talk a little bit about how do you enhance networks and collaborations. And so I'm happy to introduce uh, Carolyn Kin Kidd, who is a clinical trainer for the Mid-Atlantic AATC in West Virginia. Um, and I've worked with her for a long time. So I'm going to turn it over to Carolyn. You're on mute, Carolyn. Thank you, Dr. Frank. Thank you for that. And uh, thank you for the introduction as well. And I would like to um, say good afternoon. And I'd like to really thank our partners um, for seeking our input, uh, the Mid-Atlantic's input on um, this uh, webinar for everyone. So the first, next slide, please. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about are um, community engagements and things that you can consider. Uh, one of the really most important things are um, having communication during or, or before um, a cluster or an outbreak um, occurs. As you heard in the interviews, it's so important to be aware of the different agencies in your communities. Um, it makes it much easier for communication and knowing who to contact to actually coordinate services for the best outcomes um, for patients. Having this in place can have a quicker response to action and getting people tested, getting them linked to care and to coordinate other services that might be needed. Um, so knowing your community, um, working with people who you think are influential, people can, who can help you um, get to the goals of um, your response to an outbreak. Building coalitions and trust, convening of groups in your areas, using technology. Um, and I wanna touch just for a moment on technology in some very rural areas um, in West Virginia, uh, they, they, people don't have a lot of bandwidth, um, if any at all. So that's something that you have to think about as well. And then you want to think about what are those best practices and what are the lessons learned um, from those folks who have already gone through um, a response to an outbreak. Next slide. 
And then some challenges. Um, so one of those is uh, actually HIV testing and doing uh, an increase in testing in some rural areas, especially those uh, in counties with low populations, it's very difficult um, to get people to test for HIV. Um, and another thing is to recognize that change is very difficult um, for clients and systems as well. Um, behavior change is uh, not a simple and linear progress. Um, it is very complex, it's complicated because it requires us to disrupt um, a habit that's ingrained over time while simultaneously fostering a new set of actions. Um, for example, just asking somebody to increase their water intake by one cup per day can take up to two months for that behavior change to occur. So have patience um, with your patients and with your systems that are trying to help you through your outbreak response and recognizing how difficult that change is. Uh, we want to reduce stigma through education. Um, hesitancy, hesitancy to adopt PrEP. Um, we can help with that by educating our healthcare providers, which is something that we as the Mid-Atlantic um, have been done been doing for for years, looking at health disparities and access to care through coordination and policy changes, and these disparities can include gender and cultural factors, poverty, a level of education, as well as others, and then educating about confidentiality, HIPAA, and how to assure a clients of their confidentiality. Next slide, please. So some thoughts on addressing um, system challenges. Uh, first thing we're gonna look at is um, intervention on important services, which include uh, transportation, homeless shelters, and food. Um, very key things to look at are how does one get transportation for care? What if you have a car that's sitting in your yard up on blocks and you have no um, uh, uh, local transportation help such as buses or rails. Um, where can people go if they're homeless and how are they gonna access food? Another piece of this is um, enhancing access to services. Um, in addition to getting people into care, keeping them in, in, in care and being adherent is very important. Where can they get their medications filled? Where should they keep their medications if they're homeless? Medications cannot be mailed if a person does not have um, an actual physical address. Having support services helps considerably um, in, in providing access. Uh, peer support, places where people feel comfortable, like first steps, providing food, computer access, and a warm place to be in the wintertime. And look at um, plan for structural barriers looking at uh, geography and weather and internet, these uh, can be quite difficult to overcome. Um, as Dr. Frank mentioned earlier, we are a state that is entirely within Appalachia. We have no statewide rail transportation system, um, very few, uh, buses to get around in some of these uh, very rural towns. So having drop-in appointments can help people um, who always can't get to their appointments on time, um, related to how far away they live, what's the weather like, and then internet access and computers can, can present a problem for many. Next slide, please. And I just wanted to go over quickly um, this critical incident uh, model that Dr. Frank uh, developed quite some time ago. Um, so our uh, uh, response was to think about the evaluation and the forward planning, which included engaging with the CDC letting folks in the state know who we were and what we could do. But most people here in West Virginia do know the Mid-Atlantic ETC and know that they can call on us at any time for assistance with whatever they need. 
We participated in calls and groups. We did some marketing and we did offer um, to help partners uh, to plan for future outbreaks. So regarding engaging and assessing, uh, we partnered with the West Virginia Health Department, with the Cabell Huntington Health Department. We spoke with and met with CDC rep uh, rep representatives, excuse me. We did Department of Health and CDC phone calls and identified clinicians. And I think this is a, port a very important piece, identifying clinicians for preceptorships. We do have the ability um, in both Morgantown and in Huntington to offer uh, providers HIV clinical preceptorships uh, where they can partner with uh, an IV physician in clinics, although right now that is um, being done virtually. We can do training and consulting as the Mid-Atlantic uh, regarding the, the issues that you see here and then engaging with other uh, federal training centers, networking with Cabell County to train first responders, which actually is a very important piece. We never want to leave uh, first responders out of this. And working with the local community health centers, participating in committees, and offering, again, our resources as the Mid-Atlantic AIDS Education and Training Center. Next slide, please. So preparing and planning for um, a cluster or an outbreak, you do need to be aware of surveillance reporting and how to access it and what it means. Um, and that's an area that we can help or that um, uh, TAP in and CAI can help as well, as well uh, TAs from them. Know if you can, uh, what is your response plan from your own state, the state health department? continue to build networks, keep abreast of changes, educating consumers, families, and the general population um, are quite necessary in planning for further outbreaks and clusters. Thank you. Okay, before we go on um, with the next presentation from um, Russell Brown, I'd like to um, answer just a few questions um, that, that appeared in, in the uh, question and answer um, tab. Um, there's a question here about um, the delicate balance of informing a community uh, of an outbreak through media while not causing panic or blame to any individual's communities um, or sp specific behavioral activities. And I wondered whether any of our panelists might want to respond to that. Carolyn. Yes, I actually, I was just getting ready to say something. I can answer that. Um, informing community um, is a very delicate thing to do. Um, you need people who, um, who are good at speaking with the media. You need people who are informed, um, people who are not biased um, to actually get into contact and speak with the media. So I think those are some really important things. Thank you, Carolyn. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I, I would also add that um, this is why ongoing surveillance, knowing what's going on uh, in, your, in your state is really important. What's going on in your jurisdiction is very important. Um, and engaging with other people uh, with uh, HIV planning groups and other leaders in the community and sort of figuring out what's gonna be your plan. Uh, what is gonna be your plan for working with the media? And that's uh -huh. something that maybe in the jurisdictional plans, maybe people want to think about. Um, how are you going to do that? And who are going to be the people that are going to put their heads together uh -huh. um, to be able to spot, respond to media questions or to let the community know? Uh -huh. um, and that might be something that um, TAP-IN could provide some technical assistance on um, going forward. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I, uh, let me jump in for one sec. <clears throat> Excuse me. As we've seen with, um, you know, the failure to provide good, consistent public health messaging in the pandemic and what the consequences of that have been, it's really important to plan ahead for this. It's not something that somebody can do on the drop of a dime. It's really something you want to give to a person who knows what they're doing, who understands how to deliver a message, and you want your uh, incident command or, or um, you know, the, the, the control group to have some input um, from the clinical leadership about that messaging and to deliver it consistency, consistently. So you're absolutely right. We can provide TA on that. And also, um, you know, if your current jurisdiction plan doesn't address who is responsible for that, that would be something you definitely want to go back and revise. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Linda. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Will, and thank you, Carolyn. Um, we're gonna move on here. Uh, we don't wanna run out of time because we wanna, um, we have a poll to do at the end and we wanna open up for discussion again. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to Russell Brown, who's gonna talk about um, available resources at the National Association of Community Health Centers. Russell. Thanks, Dr. Frank. Um, my name is Russell Brown, and I just want to thank the Mid-Atlantic ATC and Tick the Tappan team for allowing me to speak about NAC and the health center infrastructure and sort of some of the resources um, that are available. Um, so as Linda said, my name is Russell Brown. I'm the Director of uh, Grants uh, Administration and Division Operations within the Clinical Affairs Division at NAC. Uh, next, oh, that's the slide. Okay, great. Um, so I wanted to take some time to walk through at a 30,000 foot level what the health center infrastructure looks like. And as someone who started their career as a HIV tester and medical case manager within a health center in Boston, I did not quite grasp the breadth of the infrastructure that was in place at the state and national level. So as of 2019, federally qualified health centers uh, operated around 1,400 service locations with 11,000 delivery sites. Now to support the health centers, there are organizations called primary care associations. There are currently 52 uh, PCAs, as we like to call them, in the country. Uh, some are region-based, others uh, cover multiple states, and they provide health centers with quality improvement and coaching, uh, training and technical assistance, and they deal with policy around Medicaid and ACO development as well. Additionally, there is another type of organization called a health center controlled network. These are membership organizations within a, with a federal designation that provide health centers with data, data warehousing, um, electronic health record adoption and training, um, UDS reporting, and other regulatory compliance oversight for their members. As of today, there's about uh, 80 of these organizations throughout the country. And so the reason this Venn diagram is important is that we're all working together and NAC sort of uh, sits itself as sort of the advocate for all of these organizations. Uh, next slide. Um, as of 2019, Health Center served approximately 30 And out of those 30 million patients, 81% were either uninsured or publicly insured, 91% were low income, and 63% of the population at that time identified as racial and or ethnic minorities. Next slide, please. So uh, there's a saying uh, within the health center field that one, it goes something like this, uh, that once you see one health center, you have seen a health center, just a health center. However, there are some things that are very common amongst all federally qualified health centers. Uh, for most, each health center is required to have a board that is comprised of members or consumers of the health services um, within the organization. And that is 51% of the board. So they have a overwhelming share of uh, oversight in terms of uh, goals G, and things of that nature. Secondly, health centers are located in very high need areas and they provide services that regardless of the patient's ability to pay will offer those services as part of their uh, goals and strategy. Um, a health center can you know, provide the following services uh, as it relates to health services. And you see um, family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics. You see some um, health centers do provide actual testing and laboratory services within their health center. Um, even some uh, 
uh, health centers have dental screenings or a dentist office. Um, they have pharmacies. They provide referrals to other CBOs in the area or other uh, medical providers as needed. Um, as already I stated, we provide patient case management on a day-to-day -day basis. And then also a lot of the enabling services. And as you heard uh, previous presenters on this, this is a, is a huge need amongst, uh, especially during a cluster response, about getting transportation, food services, outreach, health education, which we talked about, and transportation as well. Um, next slide, please. So health centers and HIV. So um, I just wanted to highlight some things around uh, HIV and specifically uh, utilizing the UDS data set, which is a uh, annual reporting uh, requirement for federally qualified health centers and lookalikes um, in which they fill out this large report and it gets sort of analyzed by HRSA and the Bureau of Clinical Care. Um, so this is some of the statistics out uh, from last year. So approximately one out of every 100 patients is a person living with HIV. 3% of new infections were in, new, were in health centers. Um, HIV patients have on average four visits per year, um, which is indicative of a viral load suppression, which is amazing. And then also just as a heads up, uh, this, there's a new UDS requirement for the 2020 report on specifically PrEP and HIV linkage to care. Um, and I just wanted to highlight these statistics. Uh, this is a comparison with the general US population. But if you remember earlier, 63 of the patient, 60 percent of the patient population that utilizes health centers identify as a racial and or ethnic minority. And we all know that HIV disproportionately affects black men who have sex with men, gender people, and black women. So a, a good majority of the patients that are seen in health centers, are not a good majority, but they're at risk for potentially um, getting HIV or they can be involved in HIV preventative services. Um, I just wanted to uh, highlight uh, that right now, health centers have additional reporting requirements, like I said, for the next cycle. Um, PrEP utilization and PrEP prescribing will be measured for the first time in the 2021 report. I think this is a great first step in terms of tracking information, and this was sort of led by the Ending the HIV Epidemic Initiative. However, from a practical approach, what it doesn't measure is actually adherence to the drug and uh, just specifically initiation. So, or at least within it's within its uh, electronic health record. So, uh, where I think there could be opportunities to connect with folks is around the adherence. You know, connecting with your community, um, ensure that the case manager, the case navigator, the navigator, or the patient navigator is involved and understand the services and connecting those patients. Um, lastly, health centers uh, also, regardless of the Ryan White funding, were written into the Ending the HIV Epidemic Initiative. And the role of the health centers, and I think this was highlighted in several other presentations as well, is to really provide those HIV prevention services, uh, both to prevent clusters or outbreaks, but also to assist and respond to them um, allowing patients to be connected into care that may have been lost or may have never actually been initiated into care. Um, health centers do provide PrEP services. Uh, this is something that I think was highlighted as well on previous slides. There is difficulty around training and adoption for regular primary care providers, but there's, as you can tell, there's many services out there such as the AACs to really help uh, with the education for providers. Uh, next slide. Great. So uh, who is NAC? Um, NAC was founded in 1971 and we're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. Uh, so NAC acts as an ag uh, sorry, advocacy organization that supports all community health centers that are medically underserved and underserved patients uh, throughout the United States. Um, so we have multiple areas of focus uh, within the organization, but for the purposes of today's webinar, um, NAC um, acts as a partnership broker between public health departments and their local health Center or state-based primary care association. We are involved within the TAPIN role and, uh, and uh, that will conclude my presentation. So if there are any questions, you can do it from here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Russell, very, very much for your presentation. We're gonna move on um, to hear from NASDAQ. Great, thank you, Dr. Frank. Hi, everyone, I'm Jennifer Flanagan, manager on the health systems integration team at NASDAD, and I'm joined by my colleague, Edwin Corbin Gutierrez, associate director of the health systems integration team. Thank you so much for joining with us, joining us today. As the systems coordination provider, which I will call SKIP, 
During this presentation, we will provide support to the 47 Ryan White HIV AIDS program, Part A and Part B jurisdictions, working in close coordination with CAI, the technical assistance provider for this initiative. For this project, we're working with um, four partners, as well as working across programs at NASDAD. Our four partners include ASTO, the Association of State Health Officials, NACHO, the National Association of City and County Health Officials, Southern AIDS Coalition, and the JSI Research and Training Institute to leverage existing expertise across prevention, healthcare access, drug user health, and health systems integration teams. For this presentation and for the next five minutes, we want to share a high-level overview of the support that NASDAQ can provide EHE jurisdictions in preparing to respond to clusters and addressing Pillar 4 in your EHE work plans. Next slide, please. NASDAQ has three objectives for this innovative project. Support the coordination of EHE efforts across federal EHE funding streams within jurisdictions. Assist in forging partnerships with key stakeholders across systems and communities. And to share promising approaches and strategies across EHE jurisdictions to advance innovation. Through each objective, we will be able to support jurisdictions efforts to conduct cluster response activities while working closely together with CAI's TAP-IN. Next slide, please, and I'll turn it over to Edwin. Thank you. Uh, so let's briefly dive into some of the issues that we are hearing about from EHE jurisdictions, which are helping us prioritize our TA activities and materials. And uh, so supporting EHE jurisdictions in developing state and local health department collaborations in, is, is really the core of our work. And this means aligning EHE response strategies with CDC required cluster detection and response plans that states are developing. And we know this is a priority for a number of jurisdictions. And as a skip, NASDAQ is able to facilitate coordination meetings with health department staff to bridge historical and philosophical differences across Ryan White and HIV surveillance and prevention programs. And through, throughout the project, we will gather and share peer approaches uh, that health departments uh, are, are, can showcase um, to align program goals, strategies, activities, and indicators. And the other aspect of coordination that we are addressing is internal collaboration within each health department. And this includes sharing models, showcasing collaboration with STD partner services, HIV prevention programs, and with other programs uh, with outbreak response experience, including uh, tuberculosis and, and foodborne illnesses. Uh, we understand that it can, be, um, it can be difficult to engage all relevant programs that are not um, all, all health department, and not all health departments are well integrated, especially when it comes to engaging non HIV related programs and things like uh, working groups, uh, cross programmatic working groups. And, and it's also very much a reality that cluster response needs champions and, and support at the leadership level, including state epidemiologists, health, health commissioners, or, or the HIV and STD medical director. Uh, so these are some of the collaborator, collaboration. Uh, support um, uh, items that, that NASDAQ can help with. Next slide, please. Uh, data sharing is one of the core components of any effective cluster detection and response plan or data to care program. And so NASDAQ is, is initially supporting uh, 15 jurisdictions that we have identified as high priority. And we are working with uh, a, a subset of these jurisdictions in designing well integrated programs helping health departments troubleshoot database comp com compatibility challenges uh, that come up as, um, and um, we share promising uh, strategies across jurisdictions to be able to troubleshoot um, through these challenges, providing comprehensive support services to clients that are engaged through cluster identification and response efforts has also been identified as a priority. And this is an area where we think EHE programs on the care side locally can really support HIV surveillance programs carrying out um, uh, the, the uh, cluster identification components. A key uh, component of our systems level work focuses on analyzing state laws, rules, and, or practices regarding HIV confidentiality and data sharing. So we are reviewing data security, legal, and ethical considerations around data sharing and confidentiality guidelines in EHE jurisdictions, and will produce individualized reports at the state level. 
We are targeting our policy analysis to inform program design safeguards in the context of HIV criminalizations, criminalization laws as well. And over the coming months, we will be updating NASDAQ's template data sharing agreements to include considerations specifically addressing the needs of local EHE care programs. And finally, we are also gathering innovative strategies that states are using to maximize the use of, of their data um, for care and prevention planning purposes, including developing cross-state health, um, health, health information exchanges. Um, for these innovative strategies, we'll gather, synthesize, and share peer processes and documents um, to support um, other, other jurisdictions. And let me turn it back to Jennifer. Next slide, please. Thanks, Edwin. Uh, so we're also working to share peer health department approaches to plan community engagement activities. We heard the importance of that earlier today. Uh, this is also a requirement of uh, the CDC CDR plan. And these include community engagement process mapping, defining communities beyond demographics, engaging leaders selected by the community, and uh, exercises and activity templates. Finally, we plan to develop resources in support of communication planning that addresses the reality that much of this work is happening in the context of governmental and medical distrust. To this end, we're compiling community participation frameworks, anti-stigma language principles, and we'll gather common community concerns across jurisdictions to inform EHE efforts. And with that, I will turn it back over to Dr. Frank. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer and um, Edwin. Um, before we move on, I want to mention that we're probably going to be over time. So if you could all please bear with us, we still have some more important things that we want to talk about. But I wanted to take one of the questions that was in the chat. Um, somebody said, my experience in two different states has been that only government workers can elicit contacts and inform contacts. Is that a federal policy? Are there times that restriction slows responses down? Um, would any of the panelists like to answer that question? Doesn't sound like anybody wants to take that question. Um, all right, well, maybe we can have somebody else um, answer that question in the chat because I know that Andrea Rogers, who does all the testing, um, is actually on, on this uh, webinar. Um, so I'm gonna ask her if she could respond to that in the chat. She's the one with the most experience um, with that. And um, we're going to move on then. Um, next slide, please. Very briefly, because we're running short on time, this is the ATC program. Across the country, there are ATCs that can work with you uh, to provide technical assistance and training. My job, wearing my hat as a member of TAP-IN, is going to be, a, I'm going to be a conduit if, there, if an outbreak or a cluster happens or there's a potential one, my job with TAP In is gonna to be to connect people with the individual people at the individual AETCs and as well as other resources that are available. Next slide, please. This is the outbreak training content and TA that the AETCs can provide. I'm not gonna go into it individually, but there's the list. Um, and it will expand. And I want to add one other thing that's not on there is that the AETCs are doing a lot around COVID-19 and HIV. So we could certainly add that to the list. Next slide, please. Standardized training methods, which we have are, we train clinicians directly. Um, we, can, we do capacity building uh, activities uh, across the AETCs. And we don't just train clinicians, by the way. We, we train the entire team, including patient navigators, case managers, um, and any other community providers. Um, and we basically use adult learning principles to, to guide all of these interventions. Next slide, please. In terms of TA, we help with convening and bringing groups of people together, 
We do on-site and distance-based interventions. Right now, everybody's sort of in, in the distance-based uh, mode because of COVID-19. We facilitate learning collaboratives. We can offer telemedicine across AETCs um, in some regions. We look at surveillance data and um, there's other resources um, available to you, um, not just from HRSA, but from the National Clinician Consultation Service that's part of the AETC program and SAMHSA, NIDA, NIH. Next slide, please. I wanna to bring to light the other federal training resources. I'm not gonna say all of them, but these are other training centers that, that wearing my hat as a member of TAP-IN, I can help to provide a conduit to connections with those other federal training centers, um, as well as the national program of the AETC program. Next slide, please. I wanna move on and Will's gonna talk about technical assistance provided directly by TAP-IN. Will. Thanks, Linda. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, very quickly, I just wanted to go over some of our overarching principles uh, that guide the work that we do with you jurisdictions. Um, <clears throat> first and foremost, we consider that establishing a real partnership with you over time is of utmost importance. And that will lead to our being able to tailor TA to the local context and the availability resources um, locally and nationally. And we understand that you've got competing priorities and strain systems, especially uh, because of COVID-19. And so we, we know that um, we need to keep pace with you uh, so that we can uh, maintain any improvements we've seen so far in HIV treatment and uh, so that we can continue to move forward. So as we work in partnership with jurisdictions, we're looking for the most effective and, and efficient actions and strategies that you can take to achieve that desired impact, even in the current environment. And here, less could be more. Uh, and throughout, we're going to work with you to foster innovation. And in some cases, this could be leveraging COVID-19 inspired or necessitated innovations, especially those associated with implementation of telehealth and prescribing ART without lab results in some cases, uh, or the full set of lab results. Um, I'd like to also um, mentioned that we are all, all of our activities are grounded in implementation science. And uh, we um, in particular want to emphasize the use of data uh, to continuously improve and answer the questions, are we doing what we said we would do and are we achieving what we expected? Could I have the next slide? Each of our regional hubs that I mentioned earlier as the way that we're delivering TA is staffed by a regional lead and, a, and up to three coaches. And it's the job of that team to get to know you and your jurisdiction team, your care networks, and to partner with you to foster success of your local EHE activities. And let me just share a couple of examples of TA projects that jurisdictions um, <clears throat> are requesting related to cluster response. And one is upgrading data systems. Um, and, this, and another is establishing data sharing agreements. And we have experts in the area of data collection, analysis, and reporting working with jurisdictions. And we can support capacity building efforts that aim to build the skills of EHE staff to use data to guide action and, and monitor performance. And as uh, Edwin mentioned before, NASTAD also offers assistance in system, systems strengthening, including models for data sharing agreements. And the other way that uh, we've been asked by jurisdictions to provide support is in the adoption and adaptation of data to care interventions by jurisdictions as a component of cluster response. Innovations include uh, delivering ART at the time of re-engagement, 
uh, and prescribing ART rapidly at the first or second touch point with a newly identified person with HIV. Uh, next slide, please. So if you join this webinar into somebody else's account, please email uh, to this address above, tap in at uh, caiglobal.org, or we put a, an email in the chat earlier so that we can uh, stay in touch with you. Um, I mentioned before that we are supporting you in trying in achieving the nation's effort to reduce HIV infections by 75% in five years. We recognize the ambitiousness of that goal and we know that our response needs to be equally ambitious. And back to you, Linda, I think we have a final poll. Yes, thank you, Will. Um, we'd like people to respond to this poll. Um, so let's see where we are now. I know who to call to get information about what to do in response to a cluster or an outbreak. So what we're seeing is 75%, oh, we, not everybody has voted yet. Look, looks like people are strongly agree or agree for that question, More, but there's, no, there's nobody that says disagree or strongly disagree. Second question, I know more about the resources available to assist. Looks like most everybody is saying strongly agree or agree. That's good news. Um, some pe a few people being neutral. Um, number three, I developed some new ideas for follow-up. This is always an outcome that we want from training, right? Um, we want innovation. We want new ideas. So we've got most people in strongly agree or agree, some people saying neutral. And I need more information. <clears throat> most people are saying they agree with that, you know, and, you know, as somebody um, always says to me, you can never have enough information. You can never stop learning. Um, so, most people agree that they need more information. Some people say strongly agree, and there are some people that say neutral. Um, and number five was, I know who to call in an outbreak response. Most people are in the agree or strongly agree category, but we still have seen some people in the disagree category and some people in the neutral category. So, what that means, of course, what all this means is that ongoing TA and education will continue to be needed about what to do about Pillar 4. Um, and so that's really why we're here today, to tell you where you can go for TA and training. Um, so thank you for your response to the poll. I think it's very informative um, and will help, really help us a lot. All right, next slide, please. So we're gonna open it up now for um, question and answers. I see Will and if um, the other speakers could turn on their cameras if they're still here um, so that we can take some more questions. Linda, I just want to note that um, the, using the Q&A function meant that we were able to answer um, quite a number of questions that came in during the presentation. And uh, one of our um, participants who is known to you uh, also answered one of those questions and we want to thank her so much, um, uh, Ms. Rogers, for, for doing that. That's right. And that went back out to, to everyone who was in the Q&A section. All right. May I also note, Linda, um, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, um, we will be sending out uh, the 
slide deck and a recording of today's presentation, including four slides that are at the end of the slide deck that we uh, are not going over right now, but are a summary of um, information. Speaking of, you can never get enough information. Um, their summary of information about um, this topic, including some step-by-step -step response um, uh, information. And Maimuna is posting in the chat the evaluation link. We'd like to encourage folks to click on that link now to go to the evaluation, uh, which is online. It's a brief evaluation. And um, we would love, it to, love to get your, your responses. And you could do that now while you're with us. Um, typically, that takes a, a few two or three minutes to, to complete. Back to you, Linda. Thank you, Will. Um, and there, there's a question in the, um, in the question answers. Can you provide the point, con point contact persons of these support organizations, individuals to reach during clusters and outbreaks? Now that is, that's a great TA question um, and something that I'm sure that, that TAPIN can provide. Um, to to the jurisdictions. Um, I'll throw it back to you, Will, for what your thoughts are about that. Sure. Uh, that was uh, similar to some other questions that we received about, you know, uh, how do we find the FQHCs that are in that are funded for EHE? Um, if you would like to utilize that uh, email address that we gave you, uh, tap in at CAI Global. Um, which was the last slide that I went over and it's in the slide deck, we'd be happy to try to connect you with local resources like that. I don't know if, if uh, Edwin would like to say anything else about that or Jennifer. Uh, just at the, at the state level, um, if, you're, if you're reaching the, um, the surveillance program, uh, NASDAD also um, has a, a directory of um, uh, HIV surveillance programs. So depending on, on exactly who you are trying to reach, uh, that might be helpful. And I will type in that address. In. So I don't see any more questions in the question and answer. Um, I just want to say what a privilege it, it has been to moderate this session. And a privilege it will continue to be for all of us to care for pr people with HIV and those at risk in our communities. Um, I wanna thank all of the persons with HIV that have gone before that it has made it possible for us to have the medications that we have to treat people with HIV and to have PrEP, uh, which is really changing the game in terms of prevention. Um, and I wanna thank all of you in advance um, for all the work that you have done you continue to do and you will do in the future to ending this epidemic in America. Uh, it's a very important thing. Uh, we will continue to work um, under TAP In and under all the programs that we represent in the different hats that we wear um, to end this ep epidemic. And now I'm gonna turn it back to Will. Yes, thank you so much, Linda. And thanks everybody who participated today. Uh, Linda's team uh, being, you know, the, the backbone of the team that pulled to the, the presentation together. We're already getting some really positive responses from our attendees in chat and also in the Q&A. Um, want you to know that uh, we are here to support you. And um, we have a number of other online events coming up. So if you share your email and name with us, uh, we will make sure that you are notified of uh, each of those events as they come up. This is a big topic. We realize not everything can be covered in one presentation. So um, this was our opportunity to present the overarching themes and also to let you know what kind of assistance the partnerships that we have can provide to you. Um, it's been rightly pointed out by some of the attendees that uh, each, each HIV cluster is different, whether it happens in rural or urban setting, whether it's derived from 
uh, drug sharing partners or sexual partners. And that makes a difference in terms of the response. And all of the expert um, uh, TA providers in this partnership are uh, well-versed in being able to respond in many different ways to, uh, to those clusters. So we look forward to more um, presentations like this on the issue of responding to HIV clusters. We know that it's something uh, that requires bridging si traditional silos uh, between uh, uh, organizations and uh, groups that really should be partners in the response. And, and that's really the essence of what we were talking about today is developing that network of partners that's gonna be ready to stand up a response to a cluster. So I wanna thank you all for your attendance and um, a special thanks to Linda for your expert moderation. <laughs>